All right, so you've made it to lesson 1.4, and we're finally going to learn something in calculus. Our topics today are these terms called limits and continuity. Now, you've seen this stuff before, I think. Now we're just going to try to formalize it. But the idea of a limit is this. It's really just a y value. And you're like, what? That's what we've been doing in the past. Well, there's a little bit of a tweak. It is a y value, which a function approaches. So this is the keyword, approaches, as x approaches some value. So I'm not asking you to find out what the y value actually equals to. I'm asking you to tell me what it approaches or gets closer to. The notation we use is the limit as x approaches c of the function f of x equals to this thing called l. Okay? So the x approaches to c is this part here. x approaches to c. Right? So if you look here at our example, I've given you a function that's a picture, a graph, and I'm going to ask you to find the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 limits at different values of x. So the first one says, tell me the limit as x approaches to negative 4 of the function. Meaning, as I get closer and closer to negative 4, either from the left or the right side, what y value does this get closer and closer to? And I hope you can see that it gets closer and closer to 1. Now, when I ask you for number 2, that's the limit as x approaches to negative 1. So that means I'm coming from either the left or right side, and here I'm approaching negative 1. Notice there's an empty dot at the actual value of negative 1 right there, but that's okay, because I'm asking what it approaches. What does it get closer and closer to? And the answer should be 4. Okay. You try number 3. As x approaches to 2, if you said the answer was 1, you are correct, because it gets closer and closer here to 1. And then for number 4, as x approaches to 3, notice going from the left and from the right, approaching the number 3 for x gives you a value of negative infinity for the y. And how about 5? So as I approach 5, I guess what happens here is, hmm, it gets closer and closer to negative 1 from the left, and from the right it gets closer to 2. Um, um, okay, okay, hold on. So maybe before we do 5, we should do number 6. Let me introduce to you this idea of a one-sided limit right now, okay? So we'll skip that for a sec. We'll come back to it. Notice here, number 6, I have this notation, x approach to 5 minus. This 5 minus really means 5 from the left, okay? So on my graph, I'm approaching the value of 5 from the left, so it's like having a value of 4.9 or 4.999 or 4.9999. And in this case, can you tell me what the y value is? Yeah, if you say it approaches, not equals, but approaches negative 1, you are correct. And then similarly, for number 7, this 5 plus just means 5 from the right. And so if I want to see what the y value is when x approaches to 5 from the right, that's like at 5.1 or 5.01 or whatever, Something getting closer and closer to 5. So notice I am now approaching the value of 2 for y. Does that make sense? So these are what we call one-sided limits. The limit from the left for 5 is negative 1. The limit from the right is 2. And that comes back or allows me to come back now to number 5. What do you think then is the limit as x approaches to 5? If you said it's the average, good guess, but no. See, for a limit to exist at a number, the limit from the left must equal the limit from the right. And if you look at all of these previous ones, that is totally true. The limit from the left equals the right, left equals the right, left equals the right, left equals the right. So for number five, we really just say the limit 
does not exist. Yes, it doesn't exist. D N E. And the reason is because the limit from the left does not equal to the limit from the right. So I'll just write down here the reason. I'll say because the limit from the left, so x approaches to 5, negative, does not equal the limit from the right. Okay. In order for a limit to exist, if you look at the one side limits, they must equal. Now let's contrast these with the function values. So this is what you learned back in like math 10. So now let's take a look at the function values where f of negative 4. So this is saying, what is the y value when x equals to negative 4? You see, equals, not approaches, but equals. And that's the solid dot here, 1. How about f of negative 1? So we're looking for the solid dot. The solid dot here also happens to be at 1. For f of 2, I'm asking what is the y value when x equals to 2? And notice we have an open dot, so therefore we have no value. Undefined, does not exist. And at 3, notice we have a vertical asymptote, so once again there is no value, does not exist, or no value. And then at 5, I'm looking at the value of y when x equals to 5. At 5, there is a break or a jump, but I'm looking at the solid dot, because that's what I have for the actual value, and so the answer is 2. Okay? So do you see the difference between a limit and a function value? This idea of limit will come back again and again and again as we deal with calculus. All right, our next concept today is this thing called continuity. So if I asked you how to become continuous, or at least for a function to be continuous, really, whatever you draw should be done without lifting your pencil. So continuous just means that the graph is connected, okay, without having holes or breaks or jumps. And now formally, though, we can say a function is continuous where its limit and the function value are the same. So that's the key thing. The limit and the function value need to be the same. The notation here, the limit at the value of c must equal to the function value at c. And if that's the case, we can say it's continuous at the value of c. Okay? Of course, you will see discontinuities, and that involves holes, vertical asymptotes, or jumps, and those are all illustrated in the example graph above. So if you can take a look at number 13, I'm just going to ask you, where are the x values of the discontinuity? So where is it discontinuous? Where do you see a break, a hole, or a jump? If you say x equals to negative 1, I'm good with that. If you say 2, I'm also good with that. If you say 3, definitely with the vertical asymptote. And if you say 5 because of a jump, bravo. Okay? Now, it does say all discontinuities can be classified as something called removable or non-removable. And removable discontinuities occur when the function has a limit, so meaning a hole in the graph. Non-removable ones, because you really can't remove it by filling the hole, occur when the limit does not exist, so jumps in vertical asymptotes. So which of the discontinuities from example 13 are removable? So which are the ones with holes that I can plug in? And if you said x equals to negative 1 and 2, you are correct. Okay. Now, notice that when the function is continuous, so at all these points here, as I draw, right, continuous parts, continuous parts, oops, maybe not there, continuous parts, continuous parts, continuous parts, continuous parts, at all those continuous parts, what I'm saying to you is that the function is continuous and the limits are actually equal to the values. So therefore, you can find the limits by just plugging it in by direct substitution, since the limit equals the actual function value. So I know 3x squared plus 2 is a nice continuous graph, because it's a parabola. 
So really, the limit values are just equal to the function values. So therefore, for number 15, I just need to plug in 3. 3 times 3 squared plus 2, that's 29. And there's your answer. The limit in this case is actually equal to the function value. Now notice here, number 16, you're thinking, is this a continuous function? Well, it is for most values of x. Where do you think it's not continuous? Well, with the denominator, you can say our, our non-permissible value, remember those things? Our NPV is at x equals to negative 1. So really, it's continuous everywhere except at x equal to negative 1. And in this case, because the limit is at 1, not negative 1, but 1, 1 is in the interval where it's continuous, hey, I can just plug this in 2. So nice and easy, 2 over 2 equals to 1. Okay, So this is a key statement. At x values where the function is continuous, just do direct substitution. Now you may be asking, what happens if it's not continuous? Well, ha ha ha, stay tuned for class. You'll find out then. All right, let's turn the page. So we've got a few more questions here before we're done for today. So what about piecewise functions? Once again, with piecewise functions, that's when you have two parts or two equations separated usually with different domains. One-sided limit evaluation is often necessary. So notice I've got this function, f of x. It's given by 4 minus x when x is less than or equal to 1. And it's given by 4x minus x squared when x is bigger than 1. And notice I'm asking for the limit as x approaches 1. So this is kind of weird, because at 1, you see we have the actual break between the two different functions. So before answering here, don't write that down in your notes, by the way, I'm going to ask you to take a look at the left-hand limit, so the one from the left, and also take a look at the limit as x approaches to 1 from the right. Let's see, 1 from the left, so that's less than 1. We're going to use the top function, so that's 4 minus our value, 1. So what's 4 minus 1? That's 3. And for the limit from 1 plus, that's 1 to the right, we're going to use the function underneath, that's 4 x squared, or sorry, 4x minus x squared, so 4 times 1 minus 1 squared. That also happens to be 3. So what did we say earlier when the limit from the left equals the limit from the right? Then yes, the limit at that value does exist, and the answer is 3. Okay? Now, can you try 18 on your own, please? Okay, same idea. I'm going to be quiet for a few seconds. You try it yourself first, and then come back and check your work with me. Did you see that the limit from the left does not equal to the limit from the right in this case? So because of that, the limit does not exist. Okay. You got that? Give yourself a pat on the back. Now for number 19, it says use the same function g from above. Now calculate the limit as x approaches to negative 1. Now notice negative 1 is not in that breakpoint here of the domain, so we just have to pick the right function to use. Since this is less than 1, I'm going to use the top one. I know that 3x minus x cubed is a continuous function because it's a polynomial. So it is continuous on its domain. This is within its domain, so I'm going to plug in negative 1. So that's negative 3 minus negative 1, and that's just negative 2. And that is the limit value, which is also equal to the function value. All right. And the last thing I want to show you is this different function you might not have seen before. Another function that requires one-sided limit analysis is what we call a step function or the greatest integer function. This is not an absolute value, it's actually two bars, okay? So if you see this x between two bars, then this is the greatest integer less than or equal to x. 
For example, if I said x is 3.9, the greatest integer less than or equal to 3.9 is 3. If I said the 5 is the value, the greatest integer less than or equal to 5 is 5. And if I gave you, let's say, negative 0 0.5, the greatest integer less than or equal to negative 0 0.5 is, remember, less than or equal to, if you said negative 1, you're correct. So I asked, in this case, what's the following limits? If I have x approaching to a half, notice a half on the graph is right here. And notice the greatest integer less than or equal to half, of course, is 0. That's good. If I asked you, though, what about the limit as x approaches to 1, you might say, well, the greatest integer less than or equal to 1 is 1, which is true, but that's not the limit. Because remember, the limit, you should be thinking, especially this is a step function or where there's a break, you have to calculate the limit from the left and also calculate the limit from the right. Oops. And the limit from the right is like, yes, 1, because you're saying what's the greatest integer, for example, less than or equal to 1.000001. And yes, that'd be 1. But if I take it one from the left, the uh, number now is what is the greatest integer less than or equal to what? Point nine 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 nine. And you can't say one anymore, it's actually zero. So therefore, once again, the limit from the left does not equal to the limit from the right. Therefore, it does not exist. Now, spend some quality time working on assignment 1.4, okay? Do it carefully, consistently, because this stuff can get a little bit tricky, but if you get this stuff well, it will set you up for great success in the first, hey, two, three weeks of calculus? Yeah, and beyond. Okay, bye for now. Oh yeah, start doing assignment 1.4.